Now, all of these years, just like you'll see, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, these are all noted with a P for P for pro forma or for uh, projected, similar to how we use A for actual. Right? Dollars are in millions, as they often are, um, and as they have been in all of our models. All right, so the first thing we need to do, we're going to start at the top line. We need to calculate revenues for each year. And this will be very similar. This will be basically identical to what we did last night and yesterday in our DCF example. We're basically just going to take the prior year's revenues, multiply them by one plus our growth rate. The growth rate being on the assumptions tab. So in year one, or 2009, I want to say equals G7 times left parenthesis, one plus, and now I want to go up and link to my growth rate on the assumptions tab. So I'm going to hit control page up. And I want to link to cell H8 on the assumptions tab. So equals G7 times the quantity one plus H8 on the assumptions tab. Close parenthesis. When you hit enter, it'll take you right back to the model and you should have 210 million for year one projected revenues. Right. So if you have 210 in year one, now we can fill that to the right. because that formula is going to be the same in each year. Take the prior year's revenues times the quantity one plus this year's growth rate. And then if you hit F9 to recalc, you should see revenues growing to, uh, to reach 255.3 million by the year 2013. Next thing we need to do in our model is we're actually going to show the percentage growth. We're going to show the growth rate right in line here because chances are this model is going to go in front of a client. One of the key things they want to understand when they look at a model is, well, what is the growth rate? What is the margin? What are those you know, basic measurements that we like to include? We don't want the client having to pull out a calculator each year and figure out what the growth rate is. So we're going to show that in line with the model. And rather than just typing in 5%, what we're actually going to do is we're going to calculate it right here. One, to show the client, but two, also to make sure that we've done the, done the math correctly or done the calculation correctly. So the formula for each year is just going to be equals this year's revenues divided by last minus one. In other words, for year one equals H7 divided by G7 minus one. I'm going to put up, I'll put up a couple formulas over here that we'll use just so we can, because we'll reference back to that using a growth rate. So, so a growth rate one year equal, it's going to be this year divided by last year minus one. All right, so that's a one period growth rate. And obviously, it should be 5%. We'll copy that across to the right or fill that to the right. Now, when a client picks up the model or if we're the analyst, we're building the model, we're giving it to our associate to check, they can quickly see, okay, 5% a year. Matches the assumptions page, consistent with historicals, makes sense. Cost of goods sold. All right, remember, we said cost of goods sold is going to be 40% of revenues. So in order to calculate this here, I want to say equals revenues, or H7, times control page up. I want to go back to my assumptions tab, H10. Cost of goods sold is a percentage of revenue. So equals H7 times H10 on the assumptions tab. You should have 84 million in year one. Now just like how we've displayed our revenue growth rate above, we're going to show right here in line cost of goods sold as a percent of revenue. For the client's sake, so we'll say equals H10 divided by H7. Cost of goods sold divided by revenue expressed in percentage terms. And we know it should be 40%, but this shows the client. It also makes sure that we've done our calculation correctly. And now we can fill both of those across to the right. F9 to recalc. And your numbers should look like this. All right, moving right along, gross profit. 
Gross profit, as we know, because we've seen the income statement so many times, is simply equals revenues minus cost of goods sold. So H7 equals H7 minus H10 should give us 126 million in year one. And the gross profit margin, remember, anytime we say margin, we're saying divide that item by revenues. So gross profit margin equals H13 divided by H7, or 60%. And once we have those, we can fill those to the right, hit F9 to recalc. And our numbers should look like this. Right now here we're going to get to one of those situations I mentioned or I alluded to earlier. We're going to link, when we calculate depreciation, we're going to link to something that does not exist yet. Right, remember, depreciation is going to be calculated as a percentage of gross PP&E. We're going to multiply this year's gross PP&E by that 2%. Right? But we haven't gotten to gross PP&E yet. So initially, we're going to be multiplying by 0 times 2%. Depreciation will initially be 0. The value that we get here will be wrong, but the link will be correct. And once we get down and we populate the gross PP&E cell, it will automatically update up here, and our depreciation will be correct at that point. The value will be correct. Okay, so for depreciation, I'm going to say equals. I'm going to scroll down to my balance sheet. Cell H53 equals H53 times, control page up, H12 on my assumptions tab. Depreciation as a percent of gross PP&E, that 2%. All right, so again, equals H53 times H12 on the assumptions tab. And as I just explained, initially that value is going to be zero. But the link, the reference that we've set up is correct. We can fill that across to the right. And then we get to amortization. And remember on our assumptions tab, we noted amortization as being zero per year. All right, so rather than hard coding as zero, I've got a link to my assumptions tab. I want to say equals control page up, H13 on the assumptions tab, that's zero. And then I want to hit enter. Control R to fill across. Again, when we get into leverage buyouts next week, what we're going to do is take this model, put ourselves in the position, uh, or put ourselves in the shoes of a private equity firm and say, what would it look like if we were to do an LBO of company A? In connection with that deal, we'll have some financing fees that need to get amortized. Instead of you know, re-architecting our model, I can enter my amortization in here, and it will automatically flow through my model. So I build my model with a little bit of flexibility so that we can change some assumptions and change the output in our model later on. As opposed to, say, just hard coding zero all the way across on my model tab. We don't really want any hard codes on this model tab at all. It should be all output. Okay, SG&A. Remember we said SG&A was going to be 30% of revenues. So I want to say equals revenues, H7 times control page up, H15 on my assumptions tab. So revenues times H15 or 30% on the assumptions tab should give me 63 million for SG&A. And here we'll show SG&A as a percent of revenue. Just because it's interesting, it's a big number, it's significant. The client's probably going to want to know what SG&A represents. So we'll say H19 divided by H7, and we should get 30%. And as always, we can fill to the right, F9 to recalc. And what you should see is your numbers, the dollar amounts for SG&A increasing from 63 to 76.6 .6 by year five, but as a percent of sales, saying, staying at 30% every year. Okay, next item, operating income or EBIT. It's just going to be, we're going to calculate it all off of this page. We're going to say equals gross profit, H13, minus depreciation, minus amortization, minus SG&A. Right, so the formula equals H13 minus H16 minus H17 minus H19. 
and you should get 63 million for now. Remember later when we update our model, when we have a depreciation figure up here, this number will fall. Right, but for now the links are correct. And our EBIT margin would just be H22 divided by H7, 30%. And fill that to the right, F9 to recalc. Now, EBIT is not something that we normally see as part of a financial statement. It's not something that accounting rules require us to calculate. But a lot of companies look at it because it's a proxy for cash flow. Bankers look at it for the same reason. EBITDA is an important figure. Okay, so we're going to calculate it. We've set it aside or we've set it apart from the rest of the model. We've put lines kind of on, uh, over it and below it to set it apart. Um, we're not really going to calculate anything else in our income statement using it. But again, it's important to show, so we're going to show it here for the client's benefit, for our own benefit as well. And EBITDA, as we know, is simply equal to operating income or EBIT plus depreciation plus amortization. In other words, equals H22 plus H16 plus H17. And right now, we should get a number of 63. We can calculate a margin, which is simply equal to H25 divided by H7, EBITDA divided by sales. We can actually show a growth rate here as well because it's interesting to see how EBITDA has grown. So using our one period growth rate, this year divided by last year minus one, my growth rate will be equals H25 divided by G25 minus one. 5%. We can fill those items to the right, hit F9 to recalc. All right, here's another situation where we're going to link to something, to two items that we still haven't gotten to yet in our model. We're going to link down to our debt schedule to pick up interest expense and to pick up interest income. All right, right now these are numbers, these are values that don't exist. They'll initially be zero once we do our debt schedule, these will get updated and populated accordingly. So for interest expense, I want to say equals, and I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of my model and select cell H134, H134, total interest expense. And for interest income, I want to select cell H136. And then we've got something here called net interest expense. This is basically just interest expense minus interest income. So in that cell, we'll say equals H29 minus H30. Once we have all three of those, we can fill them to the right. Seems like a lot of work to get a bunch of zeros into the model, but it will save us time later on because these will automatically update once we get down further in our model. Okay, then other income or expense. Remember back on our assumptions tab, we said these, be, these would be zero. We're going to link to that right now. I want to say equals, control page up, H17 on the assumptions tab. All right, again, no hard codes on the model. If I want to make a change to this number later on, I make it on the assumptions tab. It will automatically update on my model because I've linked it. And now we come to pre-tax income. Pre-tax income is just going to be our EBIT from above minus our net interest expense plus that other income item. All right, the way we've set up other income slash expense is to the extent this is a positive number, it's income, so it needs to be added. All right, and if it's negative, we'd be adding a negative, which would take it into account as an expense. All right, so we want to add that cell, not subtract it. So for pre-tax income, my formula is going to be equals H23 minus H31 plus H33. I'll leave that up for a moment. EBIT, less interest expense, net interest expense, plus other income. And right now that equals 63 in year one, growing to 76.6 .6 by year five. Two more items on our income statement. We need our taxes, and then we can calculate our net income. And our taxes are gonna be calculated by taking our pre-tax income, multiplied by our tax rate, which again was 40%. So what I want to say in this cell is 
equals H35 times control page up, H19 on my assumptions tab at 40% tax rate. If I hit enter, right now that number, that value should be 25.2 million. And then the next cell, we're going to actually calculate the effective tax rate, not because we don't know what it is, but really more, again, to show what the client, to show the client what the effective tax rate is. Um, but it also can make sure that, you know, we've done our calculations correctly. Right, and obviously, it should be 40% in every year. And our tax number should go from 25.2 to 30.6 by year five. Okay, again, these numbers will change later. Once we get some depreciation, once we get some interest expense, the numbers will change. Our tax rate or our taxes will come down. But for now, that's what the values should be. And the last item is calculating net income, which is simply our pre-tax minus our taxes equals H35 minus H37. Year one, that should currently, that number should be 37.8. Our net margin, just like any other margin, we take that item, or H40, divided by revenues, or H7, 18% so far. And our growth is this year, divided by last year, minus one. All right, well, we've, at this point, we've got the income statement completed in terms of setting up our links and our formulas. Income in year one, 37.8 million, growing to 45.9 million by year five. And it's probably a good time to save. I like to save a few times as I go, at least after I complete each financial statement. So quick control S, we'll save. Uh, you don't, don't ever wanna have to redo a lot of your work if Windows crashes or if you get a error that you can't fix. So just get in the habit of saving periodically. Now it's on to the balance sheet. Just like before, we're going to work from top to bottom. First line item is cash. Where am I going to find cash? Yeah, it's the last line of the cash flow statement. Ending cash per my cash flow statement. So in cell, so in this cell here, in cell H47, I want to say equals. And I want to scroll down to the last line at my cash flow statement, cell H110. Nothing's there yet, but again, as we update that, it will automatically populate back up above. Should be zero right now. And fill that to the right. But again, I was linking to cell H110. Next item is accounts receivable. And remember what we said about accounts receivable, inventory, a lot of those working capital items, we're going to calculate them based on an assumption of turnover. That is, how many days does it take the company to collect its receivables? The base formula to calculating accounts receivable days, the way it's initially calculated is to take accounts receivable divided by sales times 360. We went over that in one of the earlier classes. Well, in this case, what we're trying to do is solve for AR. In our assumptions, we know what our days are going to be. We're assuming 30 days. We know what our revenues are per our model. And 360 is a constant. So if we do a little bit of algebra here, we can solve for accounts receivable. So the formula that we need to use to solve for accounts receivable is we take our AR days, we multiply by sales, and we divide that by 360. This is the formula I'm going to use in this cell here to calculate accounts receivable. All I did was a little bit of algebra to convert that. So my calculation of accounts receivable equals control page up, accounts receivable days, H22 on the assumptions tab, times Control page down, times H7 on the model tab, divided by 360. And you should get 17.5 in year one. And so again, that formula 
taking this year's revenues, or H7 on the model tab, times my accounts receivable days assumption, or H22 on the assumptions tab, and dividing that result by 360. All right. So receivable days, receivables year one, 17.5. Fill that across to the right. We see that receivables grow to 21.3 by the end of year five. Intuitively, this makes sense. As I look at my numbers, I'm always trying to do a little bit of an eyeball or a gut check as I see my numbers. If I see receivables go way up when I know that revenues are only growing 5% and my assumption on receivable days is staying constant, you know, it's 30 days in year one versus 30 days the prior year, then I know I've done something wrong with my formula. All right. In this case, Receivables go up from 16 to 17.5, basically a 5% increase, consistent with my revenue growth. And because my receivable days stay about five, stay about 29, 30, that increase makes sense intuitively to me. Right, when you see big changes, that's when you need to get worried. Okay, now we're going to do a similar calculation for inventory. In the case of inventory, however, we use cost of goods sold as our base instead of revenues. All right, so if we take the base formula for calculating inventory days, that's calculated by taking inventory over COGS times 360. Just like up here, in this case, I know what my inventory days assumption is. It's 45. I know what cost of goods sold is because I've already calculated it. 360 is a constant. I'm going to do the same algebra up here. So if I'm solving for inventory, the formula I need to use in my model is inventory days times COGS divided by 360. Make sense? Same math I did a moment ago. Again, we're just using COGS, cost of goods sold as the base instead of revenues because inventory is closely related to cost of goods sold. All right, so to calculate inventory, I want to take this year's COGS, H10 times control page up, H23 on the model tab, and inventory days, 45 days, divided by 360. And I should get 10.5. And the quick eyeball or the quick gut check I'm making, I see inventory increases by half a million or 5% consistent with my revenue, my cost of goods sold growth. And I haven't changed my assumption regarding days, so it makes sense to me. If you get a radical change in inventory, either up or down, it should tell you you've, you've probably used the formula incorrectly. Once we have that, we can fill to the right. F9 to recalc. And inventory should grow from 10.5 in year one for 2009 to 12.8 in 2013. And the last item in my other current assets, or in my current assets section, are other current assets. We're just going to link back to our assumptions tab. H24 on the assumptions tab. We're holding other current assets flat at a million. And then we'll fill that to the right. And now we can sum up our total current assets in each year. All right, well here we come to one of our first subtotals that we need to calculate. We need to calculate total current assets. There are basically three different ways that we can sum these up. Okay, I can go through and I can say equals cash plus receivables plus inventory plus other current assets. All right, a lot of different keystrokes, not really that efficient. And at the end of the day, if I do it this way and then later I come back, I edit my model and I insert a row in here, maybe we've got another category of assets we need to take into account, it will not automatically pick that up. So that's the least preferred way of summing these up. All right. The second way to do it is to use a sum function. Greatly preferred in this case. The way a sum function is set up is to say equals sum it's a function that's built in within Excel. So when you say sum, Excel knows what to do. And then you need to tell Excel what numbers you want it to add together. 
In this case, what range do we want Excel to sum up? So equals sum, open parentheses. Now you need to specify a range. And in this case, our range is cash all the way down through other current assets. You can hold down your shift key, use your arrow key to select that range. You can hit then close parenthesis, right parenthesis, and hit enter. Again, a sum function equals sum, and then highlight your range. And the syntax Excel uses to specify a range is usually if you're selecting you know, more than one cell, it will take the first cell in that range, in this case H47, then it'll put a colon, and then it'll take the last cell in that range, in, ca in this case H50. And that's telling Excel sum all the cells on in, that, in that range, inclusively, first cell through the last cell. In this case, you should get 29 million. Right. In many cases, that's the best way to, to sum something up. Okay. But in this case, there's a third way to do a sum function, and it's also a little bit of a quicker way. Does anybody know what it is? Alt plus. Um, actually, it's alt equals. But basically, <coughs> if I reverse what I've just done, if you hit alt equals, that is the shortcut for doing a sum function, and it will automatically select the cells directly above, or maybe if you know, you're summing from the left to the right, we'll select those cells to the left. But in this case, it'll sum up until there's a blank cell, and it'll stop right below that blank cell. In this case, this works because it automatically highlights and selects the range that we need. If we had, however, a number up in here, in this cell here, and we tried to do alt equals, it would automatically include that regardless of whether we wanted it or not. So you need to be a little careful in terms of when you use alt equals. You can't always use it, but in some cases, when you can, it's the quickest way to get a sum function. And again, now because I'm using a sum function, if I ever insert a row in between here, that row will automatically become part of that range, and it will automatically get picked up in my sum, right? as opposed to going through and saying equals each individual cell. So once you have that, control R, fill right, F9 to recalc, you should see current assets going from 29 million in 2009 to 35 million by the end of year five. All right, let's go on to gross PP&E. If we remember back to our instructions page, and I don't, so I'm going to go back there, we're going to calculate gross PP&E. Actually, we don't really need to go back to the instructions page. Gross PP&E this year is going to be equal to last year's gross PP&E plus our CapEx, any capital spending we do during the year to acquire fixed assets, less any asset dispositions we have. All right, pretty straightforward formula with one twist. And the twist is that CapEx in our cash flow statement is listed as a negative. All right. So if we want that to be an additive, if we want to add it to gross PP&E, we actually need to subtract that negative. All right. Subtracting a negative treats it as a positive. So we're going to say last year's gross PP&E minus this year's CapEx minus any asset dispositions we have. So our formula equals G53 minus H96 minus H97. All right, and if we have any asset dispositions, these would be positive, All right? Because we're selling an asset, we're getting cash for it. That would be a positive number, so if we subtract it, we'd be taking it off of our balance sheet. All right, so make sure you get the sign right. Most people, when they make mistakes in modeling, make mistakes in their signs. Using a negative where they should use a positive, this is a key place where people make mistakes. So make sure you get the formula correct. Equals last year's gross PP&E, 
G53 minus H96 minus H97. You'll want to fill that across to the right. And of course, right now, it's just going to be that same number every year because we haven't gotten to CapEx, we haven't gotten to asset dispositions yet. Right, so right now, that number is flat, but ultimately, when we have CapEx, it will start going up every year. And now that we have gross PP&E, I want to scroll, scroll up and show you something that I've been talking about nonstop since we started. Now we have depreciation. Okay, remember depreciation, we set it up, it's dependent upon gross PP&E. Now that we have gross PP&E, we've got six and a half million of depreciation every year. That's flowing through our income statement, reducing our operating income, reducing our taxable income, reducing our net income. All right, so that's why I've set up the model the way I did. It's starting to pay off now. Anybody need a second to catch up? I just wanted to show everybody that. Next item, accumulated depreciation. This represents, and I think we touched on this in day one as well, but as a review, this represents all depreciation expense that's been booked on our fixed assets for the entire length of time they've been on our balance sheet. So the way we calculate this, this each year is to take the prior year's accumulated depreciation and add this year's depreciation expense from our income statement. So in H54, I want to say equals G54 plus H16 depreciation. It should be 51.5 in year one. And every year it's going to increase by the amount of depreciation that we have that year. Now we can calculate our net PP&E, which is basically the difference between the two. Gross PP&E minus accumulated depreciation equals H53 minus H54. Fill that across to the right. right again, these numbers are going to change because we haven't a cap we don't have any CapEx in our model yet. But for now, the formulas are correct, and that's all that's important. All right. Then other assets, remember on our assumptions tab, we had those listed at zero. We're just simply going to link to cell H25 on the assumptions tab. And then goodwill, remember, goodwill can no longer be amortized. What that means is that it's going to stay the same every year. We're just going to keep goodwill equal to the prior year's ending balance. So in H58, I want to say equals G58. Plus, and I want to use a sum function here again, because I want to sum everything. I want to sum our net PP&E all the way down through here. So I want to say equals H51 plus sum, left parentheses, and then I want to select H55 through H58, this range here. Right parenthesis, close, or hit enter, and then you should have 305.7. And you can, as always, fill that across to the right. All right, let's move on to the liabilities and equity side of the balance sheet. First item we need to calculate is accounts payable. All right, and similar to our AR days and our inventory days, we're assuming a number of days in which the company pays its vendors, accounts payable days. This is also related to cost of goods sold, because it's buying usually raw materials for inventory and whatnot. All right, so accounts payable days. So accounts payable days are calculated by taking AP divided by COGS times 360. If we're solving for AP, we do that same algebra. AP days times COGS divided by 360. Nothing new. So in my model, what I want to say is equals cost of goods sold, or H10 times control page up. 
H29 on the, model, on the assumptions tab, divide by 360. And just like with inventory, just like with AR, I get a slight increase in AP, about 5%-ish, which makes me feel comfortable. There's not a radical change here because I haven't radically changed any of my other assumptions. Fill that to the right. F9 to recalc. Next, accrued liabilities. We said in our assumptions this would be 3% of COGS. So I want to multiply cost of goods sold, or H10 times control page up, H30 on the model tab. Accrued liabilities as a percent of cost of goods sold. That 3% should give me 2.5 million. My other current liabilities. It was cost of goods sold times H31 on the assumptions tab, 2%. So again, H10 on the model tab times H31 on the assumptions tab. It should give us 1.7. And when we fill those to the right, hit F9 to recalc, we'll see those growing as cost of goods sold increases. Yep. And now we can sum up total current liabilities. Question is, can we use alt equals here as our, to do a sum function? Yes, we can. The reason is when we use alt equals, it's going to go up. Again, it's going to capture that range all the way up to right before we have the next empty cell, which in this case is exactly what we want. All right, so alt equals gives us the sum that we want it should be 15.9 in year one, growing to 19.3 by year five. Now we come to our debt, our revolver, our term loan, our unsecured debt. And remember when we talked about modeling at the beginning of class, we were going to calculate these balances using a debt schedule. All right, so the balances for these are actually going to come from down below in our model. We're going to set up the links to those now calculate the amounts later, and those will automatically update. So for our revolver, what I want to say is equals, and I want to scroll down to my debt schedule, ending revolver balance H116, 116. For my term loan, it's equals H123. For my unsecured debt, it's equals H130. 130. So H116 for the revolver, H123 for the term debt, H130 for the unsecured debt. And for my other liabilities, I want to say equals H32 on the assumptions tab. Remember, we, we assume that these would be $2 million per year. These are long-term liabilities. Maybe they're pension liabilities. Not really sure. But at any rate, we assume $2 million per year, H32 on the assumptions tab. And now we're to the point where we can calculate total liabilities. Again, I'll ask the question, can we use alt equals to calculate this? No. In this case, we can't. What we're trying to calculate is total liabilities, including total current liabilities. Alt equals is only going to give us these four that are right above us. We still need to capture this one up here, too. All right. So instead of alt equals, let's do equals sum and then manually select that range. Equals the sum of H65 through H70. And once you have all of those, we can fill those to the right, F9 to recalc. Okay, obviously we're going to, you know, these numbers are going to change. Right, we still haven't accounted for any of our debt, so these numbers are really low. All right, but that's okay. We've set the links up. The numbers will fix themselves once we complete our model. All right, let's go on to the equity section, and then we'll be done with the balance sheet. Remember what we said earlier, retained earnings is going to be simply last year's retained earnings plus this year's net income minus any dividends that get paid out. We're not assuming any dividends in this model. 
So it's just equals last year's retained earnings plus this year's net income. Formula-wise, that is equals G74 plus H40. And then common stock, remember we said on the assumptions tab, we set it up the common stock would be 10 million a year. So we'll link to that equals H34 on the assumptions tab. Fill to the right. Now we can calculate shareholders' equity, total shareholders' equity. Can I use alt equals here? Yes, in this case I can. Again, alt equals is going to go up, get all the cells above, stop right before the next empty cell. So alt equals gets the job done. F9 to recalc. And then total liabilities and equity is just exactly what we've said. Equals total liabilities or H71 plus shareholders' equity, H76. You can fill that to the right. All right, and now we come down to a line that we may not have seen before. It's a check figure. What does this represent? Can anybody tell me? Yeah, this is something we're going to use as a quick check to see if our balance sheet balances. If our balance sheet is out of balance, then there's obviously something wrong in our model or we're just not done, or what have you. So this tells us, is our model functioning correctly? Right? It doesn't tell us necessarily whether we've made good assumptions, but it says, basically, have we set up Excel? Have we done the Excel work and the proper Excel references such that our balance sheet is in balance? And the way we calculate this is, you can see, either assets minus liabilities and equity, or the opposite. Right. Either way, when our model is done, that check figure needs to be zero in every year. All right, so I've set that formula up to be equals H59 minus H78. Again, you could have it be the opposite. But at the end of the day, when we're done, there should be no difference between our asset figure and our total liabilities and equity figure. Right. And obviously, we're not done. All right, let's start working on the cash flow statement. Remember, the cash flow starts off with net income. So in cell H82, I want to link up to cell H40, net income for that year. Right, so equals H40, you should get 33.9 million for year one. You can fill that to the right. F9 to recalc. Depreciation and amortization come right off the income statement. So we'll say equals H16 plus H17. Again, H16 plus H17 for the DNA. All right, now we get to our changes in working capital. In my experience, by far, where most students make their mistakes. Usually when I make a mistake myself in a model, it usually comes from here as well. And again, typically it's a sign change error. All right, so let's just talk through this one more time, make sure everybody understands how increases or decreases in these accounts are to be treated insofar as a cash flow statement is concerned. So if we have an increase in accounts receivable, receivable, is that a source or a use of cash? Use of cash. It's a use of cash. All right. Uses of cash need to be reflected as a negative. If I have an increase in an account payable, however, one of my working capital liability accounts, that would be a source of cash. Conversely, if I'm paying down a payable, obviously, I'm writing a check to a vendor. That's cash going out of the company. That should be listed as a use or a negative in my cash flow statement. All right, the easy way to calculate these and get the sign change correct right, is instead of taking the negative of this year's receivables minus last year's, the quicker way to do it is take last year minus this year. All right, so therefore, if receivables go up, it's are automatically treated as a negative. Does that make sense? So for receivables, our formula is going to be equals G48, last year's accounts receivable, minus H48, this year's accounts receivable. Receivables have indeed gone up by 1.5. Because I'm taking last year minus this year, that 1.5 will be captured as a negative or a use of cash. If you make sign change errors, if I had this improperly input, 
say I did this year minus last year, I had this as a positive 1.5. And assuming everything else in my model was OK, my model would be off by 3 million. The difference between negative 1.5 and positive 1.5. Now, because inventory and other current assets appear in this same order up in the balance sheet, I can actually just fill this down two cells. So if I select my accounts receivable, scroll down to, hit Control D, and F9 to recalc, I'm, all, I'm now calculating my changes for my inventory and my other current assets accounts. And now I can fill these also across to the right, F9 to recalc, and I've got it for all five years. All right, so again, the reason I was able to fill that down or copy and paste that down is because these three appear in the same order in the balance sheet as they appear here in the, in the cash flow statement. Everybody have those now? Now, my working capital liability accounts are actually a little more straightforward because, again, if those increase, those are a source of cash. So if I take the difference, if I take this year minus last year, and it's a positive, I've already got, I've already accounted for the sign change properly. So for accounts payable, in other words, I want to say equals this year, or H62 minus G62, this year minus last year. AP went up by 0.7. By taking this year minus last year, it'll be captured as a positive, as it should. It's a source of cash. And here, again, because AP, accrued liabilities, and other current liabilities, these three items all appear in the same order up, up above as they do here, I can fill this formula down two rows as well. Don't fill it all the way down to change in other liabilities. This is a long-term liability. Just fill it down to other current liabilities. Control D, we can fill it across to the right. F9 to recalc. And your numbers should look like this. Make sure you hit F9 to recalc first before checking your numbers. And then the last item I need to calculate, my change in my other liabilities. This will be calculated using the same methodologies we just used for our current liabilities this year minus last year. So for change in other liabilities, I want to say equals H70 minus G70. There's actually no change. Zero. <coughs> and fill that across. And now we can calculate cash from operations. Everybody follow, everyone with me? Any questions? Again, this is typically where people make their mistakes will make one of their most common mistakes in modeling. If your model is off, that is, you get to the end, your balance sheet doesn't balance, usually the first place I check is my working capital, make sure I got the sign changes correct. All right, now CapEx. Again, CapEx, always a negative, always a use of cash. And remember from our assumptions, CapEx is going to be um, calculated relative to sales. I think it's 5% of revenues. And so, what I want to do, because I want this to show up as a negative, instead of saying equals, I want to say minus revenues, or H7. Scrolling all the way up to the top of my income statement, times control page up, H27 on the assumptions tab, 5%. Make sure you use that minus sign. If CapEx is positive, you've done something wrong. You should get minus 10.5 in year one. Fill to the right. F9 to recalc. Okay. Then asset dispositions. Remember we put an assumption of zero for that on the assumptions tab. We need to link to that. Equals H28 on the assumptions tab. Zero. Fill that to the right. And then our cash from investing, in this case, we can just use alt equals. It's just going to give us the sum of these two. All right, so for cash from investing, alt equals. We'll fill that to the right as well. All right now, I'll point out 
if we scroll up to our gross PP&E numbers, remember initially when we entered this formula, it was staying flat at 323.2 because we didn't have any CapEx yet. Now that we've done our CapEx down below, our gross PP&E is indeed growing every year by the amount of that CapEx. If your, PP &E is if your gross PP&E is shrinking, it probably means that you did not properly set up this formula to subtract that negative CapEx figure. All right, so I'd just check on that. Make sure your gross PP&E is, in fact, growing. If it's not, let me know. We'll fix, make sure we fix the formula. And now the last, last part of our cash flow statement, cash from financing. Again, here we're going to measure changes in our debt accounts. Right? If we had changes in the equity accounts, we'd measure them here. There's no, going to be no change in our common stock. So we're just measuring our change in our revolver, term loan, and unsecured debt. We're going to do this right off the balance sheet, just like we did for our working capital accounts. And it's simply for each of these line items, we'll take this year's balance minus last year. So obviously, if the company's borrowing, that balance is increasing. That's a source of cash. If they're paying it down. That balance is decreasing. It's a use of cash, right? So for the revolver, I want to say equals H67 minus G67. And right now, you should get a minus 40.8. Right, if you've set it up properly, you should get a minus 40.8. Ultimately, that won't be the number, right? but the link is correct. Remember, our debt accounts are linked down to our debt schedule, which we haven't done yet. So this will change as we go. We can also fill that across to the right, F9 to recalc. And now, just like I did in the cash from operations section of my cash flow statement, because the revolver, the term loan, the unsecured debt appear in the same order above as they appear down here, I can copy the formula from my revolver line down to those next two. But in this case, I don't want to use a fill command. All right, the reason I don't want to use a fill command is as I look down here, this worksheet's been pre-formatted. All of these numbers or all of these cells in the change in unsecured debt line are formatted to have an underline. If I simply fill down, it's going to fill everything from, this, from each of these cells down below, not just the formulas, but also the formatting, which means I lose that underline, which means I have to go back in and reformat it. All right, so this is where we're going to use a little bit of a different paste command. We're going to use Control-C to copy, but we're going to use something called a paste special when we paste this to preserve the formatting in those cells. Right. And paste special, there are a number of ways we can do this. In this case, what I want to do is I want to paste only the formulas and not the formats. And I'll show you what I mean here. So I'm going to hit Control, I'm going to select my cells to copy, Control C to copy. When I select my range into which I want to paste, instead of hitting Control V to paste, I want to hit Alt, E for Edit, S for Paste Special, F for Formulas. Hit Alt E S, you should get this pop up. When you hit F, it should select formulas. Now, in English, what this is telling Excel to do is paste only the formulas from those cells you're copying and nothing else. All right, leave the formatting alone. So Alt ESF will paste special formulas. I hit Enter F9 to recalculate. You'll see that those underlines stayed there. Now, if you're formatting as you go, if you're not working in a pre-formatted worksheet, it doesn't matter. All right, but this was pre-formatted. I wanted to preserve that formatting. So Alt ESF, paste special formulas, allowed me to do that. There are a number of other paste special commands. We'll show you those as we go. Next week, we'll get into a couple of the others. But for now, paste special formulas is the one that works here. And the more you do this, you're going to start to see this 
automatically I need to use a pay special formula without even thinking about it. You get really good at these shortcuts. And then for my cash from financing, to sum those up, alt equals. You can fill those to the right. All right, these values will change, but my links again are correct. Just as we've seen in a number of situations. All right, and then total cash flow, as we know, is simply equal to cash from operations plus cash from, from investing plus cash from financing. Formula is H93 plus H98 plus H104. It's our total cash flow for the year. Fill those to the right. F9 to recalc. And now we can use that as well as our beginning cash to calculate what our ending cash is going to be. It's another way of saying beginning cash. Last year's ending cash. Right? Same with our debt. Beginning balance of our debt is equal to last year's ending balance. We'll use that in a moment when we get into our debt schedule. But here, when we're asking for beginning cash, we can just say equals last year's ending cash. So what I want to say is equals G110, last year's ending cash. My change in cash position is another way of saying total cash flow, my total cash flow for the year. So here I want to say equals H106. My ending cash is just the sum of the two, beginning cash plus my change in cash for the year which I can use alt equals. I can fill that across, hit F9 to recalc. All right, well look, if we look at our ending cash right now, it's currently negative. And what did we say earlier today? You can't have negative ending cash. You're not gonna see a balance sheet with negative cash on it. Right, another way of saying negative cash is we need to borrow. So let's fix that right now. And the way we fix that again, that revolver is our credit card. It's the company's way to fill cash flow shortfalls or as a way to pay down some of its excess balance if they have excess cash. All right. What I want to do is if we go to sell any, any cell in row 112, all right, any cell on that debt and interest, interest schedule row, what I want to do is I want to insert a row because I'm going to figure out, I'm going to put a formula in here that partially allows me to figure out how much I need to borrow or how much I can repay. All right, so just follow along. We're going to explain this as we go. First thing I want to do is insert a row. The shortcut for that is Alt-I-R. Okay, insert row. Alt IR. You can also insert a column. I'm not going to need to do that today. But if you ever need to, Alt IC. What I want to do in this row, now that row 112 should be blank, I want to title this Change in Cash Before Revolver. And what I want to measure here is basically exactly what we've used to tie what we're calling this, change in cash before revolver. I want to look at all the changes in my cash before I look to the revolver. Remember the logic is the revolver is going to either fill that cash flow need by borrowing, or if we've got excess cash, we can pay it down. So I want to look at all the changes in my cash flow statement, except my change in the revolver. We'll then use the revolver to balance out our cash to help get our balance sheet back into balance. Right. Formula-wise, what this formula is going to be is equals cash from operations plus cash from investing plus, and I don't want to say cash from financing because that includes the revolver. Remember, this is change in cash before the revolver. So I want to say plus change in term loan plus change in unsecured debt plus my beginning cash. 
because if I start the year with some excess cash on my balance sheet, I have a cash flow shortfall, well, I can use balance sheet cash first to fund that before I start looking to my credit card or to my revolver. All right, so again, the formula here should be H93 plus H98 plus H102 plus H103 plus H108. And this measures all possible changes in cash with the exception of my revolver. When you hit enter, you should get minus 119.6 in year one. And we're going to come back to this in a moment when we calculate how much we need to borrow or how much we can pay down on our revolver. All right, so I'll show you how we integrate that in a second. Does everybody understand what we've done thus far, though? Well, now that we have that, we can start working on our revolver. And again, like I said earlier when we were talking about beginning cash, beginning revolver balance is equal to last year's ending revolver balance. So what I'm going to say here is equals G117. I want to reference that $40.8 million ending revolver balance last year. And now we're going to figure out, now we're going to show you how to figure out how much to pay down or how much to draw, how much to borrow on our revolver, our credit card. Yeah. Again, if your numbers are off a little bit, yeah, don't worry too much. First of all, hit F9, make sure your numbers are truly off. But if they are off a little bit, keep doing this. We can figure that out later. I want to make sure you understand this more than anything. And now in our pay down drawdown line, this is really the keystone to our whole model. This is what ties our entire model together. This is what solves that circular logic that we had on the board earlier and allows us to get our balance sheet back in balance. And what I want you to do is type the following. I'm going to explain it in a minute. I want you to type minus min, minus min, left parenthesis, H112, comma H115. Right parenthesis, hit enter. All right, so minus min, open parentheses, H112, comma H115, close parenthesis. Make sure you have a minus sign on the front of this. Does everyone have that? Right, now let's explain what that is. What is, when I say min, what do I mean? Minimum, all right? That's telling Excel we're going to use a minimum function, all right? So it's telling Excel, let's ignore the minus sign for a minute. Take the minimum of either H112 or H115. Whichever number is lower, give me that. If we look at these two numbers, obviously minus 119.6 is a lot lower than 40.8. So the minimum of those two is minus 119.6 now take the negative of that, which gives us a positive 119.6. Right, in layman's terms, in English, what it's saying is, if we need cash, that is, if our change in cash flow before revolver is negative, it means we need cash, borrow that amount. Okay, if it's positive, then we can pay down some of our revolver if we have a balance. If it's positive and we have no balance, then we're not going to borrow. And that positive cash is just going to go back on the balance sheet. We'll see examples of both of those two latter scenarios that I just described as we go on. These numbers are going to keep changing. I'll come back to this and show you that. But for now, recognize that this formula says if we need cash, if we have a cash flow deficit here, borrow that amount get us to cash equals zero on our balance sheet. All right, so now my ending revolver balance, and once I calculate my ending balance, remember it's gonna go back up on the balance sheet. That change will run through the cash flow statement, and our numbers are going to adjust, all right? So let's first calculate the ending balance, just the sum of the two numbers above. 
beginning balance plus or minus any pay down drawdown. I can use all the equals here. My ending balance should be 160.3. When I hit F9 to recalc, look what's happened to my ending cash. It's gone back to zero. I've borrowed enough so that I've gotten back to zero cash on my balance sheet. Can't have negative. I've gotten back to zero. Now, if I had some minimum cash balance that I needed to maintain, maybe a bank requires it, or maybe it's just company corporate finance policy, we need to keep $25 million of cash on our balance sheet every year, we could model that in. Right? We could add another 25 to this, or subtract another 25, actually. Right? So you can model minimum cash, a little beyond the scope of what we're doing here. I just want to make sure everybody sees how this worked. I've borrowed enough cash to get back to zero. It's real, I mean, that is the keystone of the model. If anybody's ever built a model without using this, and that's how I learned how to build a model, was I kind of trial and error, beating my head against the wall. Usually what it involves is a lot of if-then statements to figure out basically what we just solved in two, two cells here. Very long, very complicated if-then statements. And then as you change your model, you've got to change some of the links in your if-then. And it can be, I've spent hours, I've spent days and nights working on if statements. You don't need it. If you know how to do this, you can model in a very simple, straightforward fashion and still accomplish the same thing. We can copy this across now, too. And when we hit F9 to recalc, now we see we're at zero cash in every year. Pretty cool. Okay, and let's actually look out to year two and beyond because now we've got a little different situation than what we had in year one. All right, if we look to year two, instead of a big negative number, now we see a positive number. What that tells us is before we look to our revolver, we've got, now we've got a cash flow surplus. We've got some excess cash, which means we can pay down a revolver balance if we have one. So our minus min formula here, take the minimum of these two, 30.8 million, take the negative of that, it says we can pay down 30.8 million. We can't pay down more than that because our cash flow surplus is only 38 million, but we can pay down up to that amount. And that's what our formula does. We pay down 30.8 million which drops our revolver balance to 129.5. Years three, four, and five, similar situations, we can pay down a little bit of our revolver each year. And that's what our model does. Everybody see that? Okay. Again, these numbers will continue to evolve as we update the model, but for right now, that's the interpretation of what we, what we have up there. All right, well, that's as hard as it gets. All right, if we've gotten through that, Everything else is pretty easy to model, pretty easy to understand. Right? And that's probably the most valuable lesson we can take away from here is this saves us a lot of time not having to do those if statements. All right, so now let's calculate the interest on our revolver. In order to do that, we need an interest rate. First thing we need is our interest rate from our assumptions tab. So we'll say equals, control page up. I want to get the interest rate for year one on my revolver, 6.25%. Sell H40 on the assumptions tab. And now that I have that, I can calculate interest expense. The one twist here is that interest is calculated using an average balance. It's typically how banks do it. They'll usually do an average monthly, sometimes an average weekly balance, depending on how it's set up but usually based on an average balance rather than you know, taking the interest rate and multiplying it by the ending balance. I would assume that this amount's outstanding the whole year. And it's probably not the case. The company's probably borrowing in increments throughout the year. So the way we do this, we say equals average, open parentheses, H115, comma, H117, so take the average of the beginning and the ending balance, close parenthesis, 
times the interest rate. So take the average balance, multiply it by our interest rate, should give you 6.3 million of interest so far. And once you have those, you can fill those both across to the right. And when you hit F9, all your numbers are going to change a little bit. All right, your interest rates will go up a little, that interest expense every year. All right, let's do the term loan. Just like before, term loan beginning balance equal to last year's ending balance. So for my beginning balance, I want to say equals G124. And now pay down, draw down. We're not doing any minus min formulas here for the term loan. We only do that for the revolver. The term loan amortization, again, is going to be based off of what we hard-coded onto our assumptions tab. All right, because it's an outflow of cash, I want to have that noted as a negative. So what I want to say here is minus, control page up, H44 on the assumptions tab. And because I've set that up as a negative, I can take the sum of those two, that is beginning balance, and my pay down. I can use all the equals to calculate my ending balance. So at the end of year one, it's 80 million. Interest rate, just like with a revolver, we're going to pull that from our assumptions tab. So equals control page up. H41 on the assumptions tab, that's 6.75%. So you should have a beginning balance of 100 million, amortization of 20, ending balance of 80, interest rate of 6 and 3 quarters percent. And then just like the revolver, interest expense will be calculated using an average balance. And actually, because we've set this up identically to how our revolver schedule is set up in terms of the order of these items, I can just copy this formula, paste it down here, save myself a little time from having to retype that average formula. So I can go up to cell H119, control C to copy, scroll down to H126, control V to paste, F9 to recalc. And once you have all five of those, you can fill to the right, F9 to recalc again. And what's interesting is that our revolver numbers have changed again. We've added more data to the model. We've added more data into our term loan section of the debt schedule. That's got pop gotten populated up in our balance sheet. That's run through our cash flow statement now, which gets taken into account when we look at this change in cash before revolver. <laughs> All right, now in year one, instead of needing 119.6 million, we only need 39.6. And so that's what our revolver is doing. It's borrowing 39.6. And then in each of the four successive years, we're paying down up to the amount of our excess cash flow. And once we update our unsecured debt in our debt schedule, it will further update the numbers in our revolver. And then when we link our interest expense into our income statement, it will further update the numbers. And you should see, be seeing a pattern. All these numbers are dependent upon one another. It's what Excel calls that circular reference. Any questions before we do the unsecured piece? Let's do the last piece of our debt, then we'll total our interest expense, we'll calculate our interest on cash, and then we're done. All right, so we're almost there. Unsecured debt ending or beginning balance is equal to last year's ending balance, so equals G131. Pay down, draw down. Just like with our term loan, I want to say minus, control page up, H45 on the assumptions tab. I know we don't have any amortization, but again, if we change the terms of that debt, we want to update it here and automatically have it flow through the model. <coughs> so it's important to set it up properly, minus H45 on the assumptions tab. Ending balance, we can do alt equals the sum of the beginning balance and any pay downs or drawdowns. Interest rate, 
link to our assumptions tab equals H42 on the assumptions tab, that 12%. And interest expense, same way we calculated for the revolver, same way we did it for the term loan. We can actually just copy that formula down because we've got the same order in our unsecured debt section as above. Control C to copy, Control V to paste. And we can fill those across, hit F9 to recalc. And what we should see so far, is we've got a beginning balance of 50, no paydowns and drawdowns, so our ending balance stays the same every year, 50 million. We're paying interest at 12%, 50 times 12%, 6 million a year in interest. And like I promised, once we updated our unsecured piece, that updated in the balance sheet, that updated in the cash flow statement, which means now it's updated as far as the revolver is concerned. So now we actually, instead of needing cash in year one, we have a little excess cash. All right, so now instead of needing cash, we've got some excess cash. In all five years, we're paying down as much excess cash as we have. Okay, until year four, we've got 13.9 million of excess cash but we only have a revolver balance of 7.2 million at the time. So there's no sense in paying down more than we owe. The minus min formula automatically takes that into account. We only pay down what we owe. We pay down 7.2. We put the balance back up on the balance sheet as ending cash, 6.7 million. And then in year five, we generate a cash surplus of 22.2. Okay, it all goes back onto the balance sheet. We end with 22.2. The last couple steps we have here, we still need to total our interest expense. We need to add it up for all three pieces of debt. Once we do that down here, remember we linked to this earlier in our income statement. So it'll update through our income statement update our net income, flow through the cash flow, and update our numbers yet again. So total interest expense is just the sum of interest for our revolver, H119, our term loan, H126, and our unsecured piece, H133. We add the three of those up, we get 14.3. We fill that across to the right, hit F9 to recalc. And our numbers update again. Once you have that, fill that to the right. It's going to be zero, all right? Because in this model, again, we're never going to pay off our revolver fully, so we're not gonna be keeping any excess cash on our balance sheet. So we have zero cash at the beginning, zero at the end. Anything times zero is zero. But when we go back and we sensitize our model, I'm going to show you how to do that at the beginning of next week's class, because we are out of time right now. And after you've done your homework, I'll show you how to sensitize a model. You'll see that in some circumstances, we will generate excess cash, and we will earn interest income on it. Right. So fill that across to the right, F9 to recalc. And now that I'm done, I'm going to scroll up to my balance sheet, First thing I want to look at is my check figure. Am I in balance? And I am. All right. That's where the check figure comes in hand, handy. Until you're done with your model, your check figure really shouldn't, it's really not meaningful. All right. But once you're done, you want to make sure that, that that is zero, which tells you that you're in balance. All right. But this tells us we've set up Excel properly, we've set up the model properly. Again, it doesn't guarantee that we've got good assumptions, right? Because you could put crummy assumptions in there and still balance. Doesn't mean it's right. But it tells us that at least our model, from an Excel standpoint, has integrity. It's going to work out.